Hello, Achim Yikarim, how are you? Hope uh, you had a uh, phenomenal Shabbat. And Bezot Hashem, you'll have a very Shavua Tov. We'll uh, start off the week talking about some of the things we're going to see this week. We're going to see the Bezot Hashem, Megillat Esther, Purim, is a very big holiday. Chazal says that when the Mashiach comes, all the holidays will be cancelled except Purim and Chanukah. Because those are the rabbinical holidays and Hashem does not want to offend the rabbis. That's how much he loves the rabbis. But one thing we have to learn from Purim is that there's something very interesting about the holiday, very interesting about the story itself that we've heard before many, many times, but maybe didn't pay attention. Before Achashverosh took over, and took over, in essence, the entire world, 127 countries, as it says in Megillat Estel. Before him, there was uh, Koresh, Cyrus. Cyrus took over, was, in essence, the, uh, the king of the world. And Cyrus actually decreed that Am Yisrael could start building the Bet HaMikdash, could start building the Holy uh, Temple. But only 42,000 Jews actually joined. Only 42,000 Jews went up to Yerushalayim and started building the Bet HaMikdash, whereas millions and millions of them did not join. Millions and millions did not believe that the prophecy is really coming, didn't believe that the promise that Hashem gave the prophet Jeremiah nearly 70 years before was coming true and just didn't believe it was time. <clears throat> didn't believe. And they were right, because technically, uh, once uh, Achashverosh came in, he hated Jews, unlike what Megillat is stale, sometimes people only hear the nice parts of the story. The background part of the story is that uh, Achashverosh was actually a bigger anti-Semite than Haman himself. And the first thing, the first day of the job that Achashverosh had, first thing he did is he cancelled the continuation of the building of the Bet HaMikdash. One thing that we notice, if we rewind it all the way back to Noah, when Hashem destroyed the world, the people made many, many sins. One of them we learned this past week about wasting seed, stealing, and pretty much every sin that you can, but the final uh, sin that they made that uh, made Hashem hate them to the point of destroying the entire world was wasting seed. But the war that they had in general at the generation of Noah was between each other. If you fast forward another 350 years approximately, you go to the Tower of Babel. In the Tower of Babel, instead of fighting each other, the people of the world decided to build a building that they could reach the sky and fight God. They figured that you know God created the world 1,646 years before and... Therefore, based on their own logic, they decided that maybe Hashem decides to destroy the world every 1,646 years. So we're going to build a tower high enough to go fight them before the next 1,650 years are going to pass. Now, if you think about it, this is a much worse sin than the people of Noah. Instead of fighting each other, they're fighting God himself. As ridiculous as it sounds, they're fighting God. And, and in essence, it's they're trying to fight him as if you can. So why didn't Hashem destroy all of them? Why was the punishment only destroying the tower and changing their languages and in essence changing the world language from being only Hebrew to 70 different languages? So here we learn also, by the way, that there was only one language for the first 1,650 years. Why didn't he destroy them like he did with the generation of Noah? For the very same reason of why we're going to learn this week, the first time that Cyrus decreed to build a Bet HaMikdash, it didn't work. But later on, it did work. Later on, after Megillat Esther is completed... And the son of Estel, Darius, decrees to build the Bet HaMikdash, it does work. The difference between the two times is that in Noah and 
with Cyrus, there was no unity. Everybody was out for themselves. Whereas in the times of the Tower of Babel, in the times of Darius, we had unity. People had achdut. They held on to each other. They helped each other. So even at an amazing time, amazing sin of fighting against Hashem, at the Tower of Babel, Hashem said, you know what? Even though they're very, very wicked, and I should destroy them. Their unity, their achdut is so strong, I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to break it up. Let them fight me. They can't fight me, but let them fight me. Let them think that they can. Still, they have unity between them. They have love, love amongst them. Let them stay. The generation of Noah, no love amongst them. They were stealing from each other. They were doing all types of sins. There's no unity between them. There's no. They can't unite to me. If they can't love each other, they can never love me. Worth destruction. The time of Cyrus, only 42,000 believers, only 42,000 people out of millions and millions of Jews believe that this is the time. There's no unity. There's no love. There's no better Mikdash. Time of Darius, everybody joined. If there's unity, even if you aren't exactly perfect, I'll still give you the next better Mikdash. So we see that in Hashem's eyes, He says that if you can't love each other, there's no way you're going to ever love me. And you can't tell me you love me if you don't love each other because we are all His creations. You can't say you love Abba if you don't love His children. Bezat Hashem, we learned a lot more about Megillat Esther this week. We learned a lot more about the parasha and a lot of other things. And this week helps us unite, helps us come together, help each other in every way that we can, help each other spread Torah, help each other get closer to Hashem, and Be'ezrat Hashem bring a lot more blessing to the world. Shavuot